In this video, I'm gonna show you how to play one of my favorite Toto bass lines of all time, Georgie Porgy. Also, there is a link below this video where you'll be able to access the PDF with tab and notation, as well as a full bassless backing track of the entire song. You just need to click the link below, download it, and you can download it for free. I'm gonna break this video down into five different sections. Form, groove, and harmony, the verse, pre-chorus, chorus, and the hit. I've also included timestamps in the description below, so you can skip around if you like, but I would recommend watching these five different sections in order for the baseline and the lesson to make more sense. So section one, we're gonna talk about the form, the groove, and the harmony. So let's first talk about the form. Now, when I break down the form and when I try and memorize songs, I use the Lego brick method, which is essentially where you learn the different sections of a song. So say for this song, we'd learn the verse, we'd learn the pre-chorus bass line, then we'd learn the chorus bass line. And then what you'll find is you only really need to know, say two or maybe three sections for most pop, rock, soul, a lot of Western music. And then you can kind of piece these sections together depending on what order they come in. So for this bass line, Georgie Porgy, we actually only need to learn three different bass parts or chord progression. And then we just need to know what order those three bass parts come in. Inside the PDF down below, I've included timestamps of when the different sections happen throughout the song. So you can listen to the song, read the PDF and know exactly where the song changes, where it goes from the verse, say, to the pre-chorus, to the chorus. Now let's quickly talk about the harmony. Now this song is in the key of E minor. So let's play our E natural minor scale. So we have the notes E, F sharp, G, A, B, C, D, E. And that's the fingering I'd recommend playing the scale using the one fret method. And then back down. So most of the chords in this song are derived from this scale. The one chord is E, the three chord for example would be G, the sixth chord C. So this is what I call the parent scale. So when we look at breaking down the harmony for this song, like the verse for example, all that is is just going six chord, C major, the seven chord in the world of E minor is the D, so a D major chord, and then the one chord E minor. And again, that's how you can break down songs really quickly using the number system. And by knowing the key, you'll know the parent scale you can use in that key. So if we're in the key of E minor, the parent scale is the E minor scale. So all the chords will be based around that scale if the harmony is simple. And we're gonna get to the chorus because the chorus is slightly different and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now let's quickly talk about the groove. When I'm playing this song, I'll be thinking of the 16th note subdivision grid in my head. So one E and a, two E and a, three E and a, four E and a. And when I listen to a section of a song, like the verse for example, I wanna pick up on what I call the skeleton groove, which is the main core rhythm that goes throughout the entire song. So there may be variations upon this main core skeleton groove for the verse. We're gonna clap it, because I think clapping is the best way to internalize rhythms is one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a. that's very, very slow, right? So we've got one E and a two E and a three. And when I'm thinking about this groove, this is the hardest part I would say when I was recording this bass line. I'm just being honest. There's other bits that, you know, are happening. Like they do later on, like technically challenging, but as far as like groove and rhythm, the hardest part you'll find if you want to be super, super accurate and make it feel really good is getting that second note, the 16th note, which comes on the A ah of two. So two E and A, ah, and then it goes to beat three, right? Two E and A, ah, three. Getting that second note so it's not, too early or too late is, is quite tricky. I'd actually recommend recording yourself so you can play this groove, listen back and see, am I playing that a bit early? You know, I have a tendency to rush, so normally I try and ground myself by thinking about the downbeat. So one, two, three. And that's actually my biggest tip, is to accent slightly the downbeat. So think about you're going towards beat three. So three, three. Because what most people do is they accent the first note and that's where it sounds a bit robotic and it doesn't sit in the groove as well. They play 
and that that's where it feels like it's kind of rushed and it doesn't quite make sense here if you go it's almost like a passing note but rhythmically so da dum da dum i'm aiming for beat three and that will make the groove sit a little bit nicer so let's move on to section two of this lesson where we're going to talk about the verse so we've already discussed groove harmony and form now let's actually dive deep into the different sections the verse pre-chorus and chorus here's a video of me playing the verse So here's how to play the verse. I'm playing a lot of it on just one string. And I think I was watching an interview from Jacob Astorius and he was saying the best bass notes on the bass are actually on this, this A string. And I've found that when playing live as well, like this C here, depending on the style of music I'm playing, sounds very different to this C here, right? This is more if I'm going for like a rounder tone, but with this bass part, it's a little bit funky and if it's syncopated, I won't play it more down here because the note is a little bit tighter, so. So that's the first part of the bass line. And again, I'm playing all the notes on the A string just because I like where that sounds within the mix. Just from playing live, it seems to fit nicely a lot of these notes on the A string. So, and then I go D. And then instead of going to this E, I go to here. For me, it feels better, but you could go that's definitely like a, a tighter sound, but that's where I chose to play the bass part. I'm not actually 100% sure where he plays it on the record. That's what I do. Let's dive deeper into these 16th notes that don't actually start on the beat of the bar, like bar three, for example, where it goes. So here I'm feeling the downbeat, I'm tapping my foot. So one, two. And as soon as I tap my foot down, I play a note. It's kind of like, ba boom, <laughs> right? So boom. Two. So I'm, I'm really feeling the downbeat and then I'm playing my notes to make sure that they line up rhythmically. Fingering wise, in my left hand, I'm shifting and I'm doing what I call Rocco muting. I stole this from the famous bass player Rocco Prestia who played with Tara Power. The technical way that, and the reason why I do this is it just blends with the kick a lot nicer than just left it open like this. I kind of like to rest these fingers down here just so I have more control over the shape of the note and it just seems to blend a lot better. Maybe not here when I'm recording at home but if I'm on a big stage just having more control over the actual sonic sound of the note it just feels a lot better to slightly mute it and that's what i call rocker muting because he does it a lot like all of that kind of stuff so that's why i'm shifting for every single note because that's how I'm, i get the best sound or what sounds best to my ear and then that's barring and then i go so this is interesting. So I'm going, this is the third bar of the verse. Uh, fourth and third finger together here, some Mandel technique. First finger, fourth and third. And then I'm just flattening down my pinky there to get that last note to bar across. If that's tricky for you, you could create a technique exercise out of that. And this is exactly what I do when I'm practicing a new tune. If I find a weakness technically in my playing, I write it down and create an exercise out of it. So that could be an exercise. So every time I pick up the bass, I dial in, what's my right hand doing? What's my left hand doing? How can I make it sound as clean as possible? And I'd actually create a technique exercise out of it. And this, that's a really helpful tip, by the way, that I've used throughout the years. Doesn't matter how complex the bass part is or how easy it is, if I can't play it <laughs> technically, I will break it down and create an exercise out of it. And then you'll be surprised because if you practice this, 
every day for a couple of weeks by the end of you know week two it will be feel really really comfortable if you're enjoying this lesson so far and you want to see more videos like this one make sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you don't miss any lessons that i release on a weekly basis it's completely free to do so and you can always unsubscribe in the future let's move on to section three the pre-chorus here's how the pre-chorus sounds Now the pre-chorus is using a very similar skeleton groove to the verse, right? The rhythm is very similar. And this is why I talk about skeleton grooves because what he's doing in the pre-chorus is he's taking the verse, he's still doing that, but then on beat four, he's slightly changing how he's getting to the next chord. And then he's doing some chromatic passing notes on the second bar. When you're creating your own bass lines or something similar to this, if you have the core rhythm, like you can have the freedom to do something maybe slightly different on the fourth beat if you want to do something yourself. So as an example, on the first bar, I could go. It creates the same effect and I'm actually using the same rhythm. I could do a slightly different rhythm like. What I'm doing is I'm sticking to the core groove, bum, ba bum. And then on the fourth beat, I'm allowing myself a little bit more freedom to do a slightly different rhythm or use different notes to get between chords. Because on the third and fourth beat, you have the most freedom to come away from the core rhythm. People talk about harmonic tension, like when you play a strange note in the chords, right? And you create a little bit of tension, but you can also do this rhythmically with groove. You can create a little bit of tension on that third and fourth beat and then boom, come back. As long as you do land on beat one on the root note of the next bar, you have a little bit more freedom on that fourth beat to do kind of what you want. That is to say, if you are creating your own bass line or playing this and you want to put your own spin on it. That third bar is a really interesting rhythm. It happens a lot in like funk type music. So we have for e and, for e and at one. So again, clap the rhythm. This is actually really helpful when trying to figure out complicated 16th note rhythms. Say the 16th note grid out loud. So one e and a, two e and a, three e and a, four e and a. Tap your foot on all four beats. One, two, three four and clap the rhythm. So we have in the third bar, one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one. So if I can clap the rhythm, I know that when I come to play the bass part and I don't play it quite right, it's not that rhythm is the problem, it's that my technique or something else is the problem. Because if I can clap it, then I just need to translate what's in my head to the bass guitar. Let me know in the comments below if you have any bass lines you'd like me to break down like this one in the future. I monitor my YouTube comments every week, so before I make another video, I'll check out your suggestions below. Section four is the chorus. Here's how the chorus sounds. Again, the chorus is using that similar skeleton groove. So, and then on beat four, slightly changes. So here we're doing like a chromatic run up to the C sharp. And I'll talk about that C sharp chord in a sec. And then we have chromatic run down to the F sharp. So four, four, and then the F sharp chord. There, to be able to do that quickly, I'm actually raking in the right hand. So if you download the PDF below, you can actually look at the bass part and see how he's slightly changing the fourth beat and how he's getting between chords, but he's sticking to the core skeleton groove. The 
he's sticking to that but then on the fourth beat he's slightly changing the rhythms and the notes between chords to add variety if you download the PDF below, all the chords are written there as well, so you can see which notes he's choosing on what chord. Now, if you like to geek out on music theory, kind of like me, <laughs> and maybe you're a little bit more advanced, it's probably not for beginners, this little section I'm gonna talk about here. Why does this C sharp chord in the second bar happen when we're basing all the chords, the key of the song is E minor, so it uses the E natural minor scale. So why is there a C sharp? Because the E natural minor scale has a C. Now that chord is actually derived from a different minor scale. And this is the tricky thing with minor harmony. So major harmony, you just have one major scale. So if this is in the key of E major, you just have the E major scale and all the chords will be based off that scale if the song is diatonic. Diatonic just means all the chords are in the key of the song. Here with minor harmony, you have three minor scales. You have the natural minor scale, the harmonic minor scale, which is the same as the natural minor scale, but with a major seventh. And you have the melodic minor scale. Ah, did you spot it there? There's a C sharp in that melodic minor scale. So in the melodic minor scale, we have a C sharp instead of a C. So what Toto are doing here, whether they purposely did this or not, <laughs> is they're borrowing that C sharp. So when they go E minor, that C sharp chord, they're borrowing from the melodic minor world as opposed to the natural minor world. So when creating minor chords in minor harmony, you can borrow chords from any three of those minor scales, the natural minor scale, the melodic minor scale, harmonic minor scale. You can borrow chords from all three of those scales, which makes minor harmony quite a bit more difficult than major harmony where there's only just one major scale. And that's why that C sharp is there. So section five is the hits, or you could call it the post-chorus because it happens after the chorus. So here's how the post-chorus or hits sound. <laughs> This section is using the chords from the chorus. So we have E minor, C sharp, F sharp, B. It's using the same chords. That's the chord progression for the chorus. But this time we've got some unison hits, meaning the whole band are playing pretty much the same thing. So to break down this rhythm, what I'll do is I'll put the rhythm on the screen here and on top, I'll put the subdivision grid, which is the 16th note subdivision grid. So you can accurately play this rhythm. So we've got one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a. So what I'd recommend is just tapping your foot on the beat, clapping this rhythm that you see on the screen now. So. A lot of that, apart from the first note uh, that we clap, is all off the beat. And to be able to play this well on your bass, I would first clap it and then put the notes on your bass. So work out the notes. We've got E, we've got C sharp, we've got F sharp, and we got B. So the reason why I'm lifting my finger off there is because I'm muting the note to make it more precise in between each note. So, so I'm pushing down, and then when I take my finger off, I'm putting all my fingers down to mute the string. I'll play it slowly. Right, did you catch the muting? It's a very subtle thing, but it just makes it sound more accurate and precise and clean. Now I've taught you how to play all the different sections. Click here to watch a video of me playing the full Georgie Porgy bass line. There's a light up fretboard, the tab and notation is all on the screen. So click here to watch this video next and I'll see you there.